Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And it has been said that kids say the darndest things. It's even like a show with that title, right? They say the darndest things. When we were running businesses, my wife and I, my daughter was very young. She went up to someone who technically worked for us and said to him, my dad says you have a half a brain. <laughs> no going back on that one. That was it. <laughs> so it made me think of a story about Sunday school. And so the Sunday school teacher is basically trying to impress on everyone how to be a good Christian, how to live a good Christian life. Right? So we have to show people that we're Christians by our good deeds, right? And going through this whole thing, and then she makes a mistake of posing a question. <laughs> Why would someone call me a Christian? After a pause, one of the kiddos says, well, maybe they don't know you yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> All, right. All right, so <laughs> we find ourselves in the rest of the story. This is where we're really honoring God's word. We're looking at the whole text here, big chunks of scripture. Uh, we looked at the resurrection. This week, we're going to look at the ascension. Now, it has been said by me a lot, the Bible's not in chronological order. So we're using charts to help you guys out. If you're interested, it's in the app and kind of put it together. Now in this chart, it's interesting because we're kind of going to be going or we will be going from the Gospels to Acts. And so I'll explain how that kind of works. Uh, and you'll see there's a little recap of the Ascension, some extra details in Acts. And so you've got to kind of put it back in where it belongs if you're trying to do it chronologically. It's a little bit difficult. So this isn't too hard of a chart. So that's where we'll be today. Um, we are going to hop right into John. So we're going to start off here as John concludes, actually. Uh, now remember, Jesus eats a lot <laughs> when, when he's back in a risen body. Well, they just mention it a lot. Why? Well, it's to prove that he's not a ghost, as he says. He's an actual being. Touch me. Feel the holes. Right? So you'll see him eating. And so we'll pick up there. John 21, 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked them. Simon, son of John, do you, do you love me? <laughs> Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, was that to you? As for you, follow me. So the rumor spread among the community of believers that this disciple wouldn't die. But that isn't what Jesus said at all. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Well, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, but that's actually, I like those verses to kind of like show people this was happening in the early church. That's not what Jesus said at all. What he actually said was this. So clarify here. So that happens in church today, happened then. So <clears throat> the three times. This has a significance. This took me a long time to get this. But <laughs> I, finally, I was like, oh, right. What does Peter do? Deny Jesus 30 times. So it's kind of like Jesus flipping it over. And what's funny about Peter being so hurt, it's like, you know, you're reading this and you can't help but think, like, you're hurt? Jesus went to the cross, and you denied him three times, right? So uh, there's another little thing, and if you've been in church for a long time, you might have heard this. Uh, if, if you did this teaching, don't do this teaching again, and I'll explain to you why. So a lot of times you'll get here, and a pastor, pretending to know Greek, will say, oh, well, these are the different loves. Like Jesus is, he can love us with an agape. You ever hear the word agape love, right? So agape, he can love us with an agape love, but you know, people can't love each other like that. You know, it's this giant love. We do like the philo love thing, the brotherly love, and they go through all the different types of loves, right? 
And so I'm going to tell you guys a secret, and it's going to make all pastors really mad. But I don't care. Everyone's mad at me anyway, so <laughs> what's the difference? So here's the truth. Right? You go through Bible college uh, or seminary, you learn like this much Greek. And when you do learn it, like, it's like having a kindergartner go to a 12th grade grammar class. Like, they, they're learning, like, arrow is tense. They're learning, like, these things about grammar for words they would never be able to read on the page. It's really funny. So, <laughs> anyway, worst part of seminary ever. So, learn the Greek later on my own. Holy Spirit Greek tutor, right? So, figure that out afterwards. But here's the thing. When you start really reading the Bible, you're going to notice something. John, Paul, they, they say beloved or Agape, like they'll say they agape the church, they love the church. Right? And then when you get to places like Titus, it's philanthropia, like God has a philo love for mankind. So what you learned there wasn't true. <laughs> so anyway, although in the text here, being fair, when you read it, each time Jesus asks the first two times, he says agape. Peter says philo back, the, the root of it, philo back. But the last time Jesus says, okay, do you philo me? And maybe there's something there to that. Maybe, but if you're reading the whole Bible, it just doesn't work that way. So we can have agape love, agapo, I love you, right? So say agapo, just means I love you. Um, and people, Greek people say that today, and nobody goes, oh, you're not God, you can't say that, right? So there you go, ruined another one for you. How do you feel, good? Yeah, you're like, hey, can you delete that sermon from YouTube? <laughs> All right, the big thing I want you to hang on to here is, just remember this, Jesus is telling Peter, you're going to die for me, right? So you're going to get martyred. He's letting him know how it's going to happen. You're going to be led away. That's what he means by that. Right? So he said it to tell him how he was going to die, what kind of death he would die. All right, if we continue in John, now John concludes, John 21, 24, this disciple is the one who testifies to these events and has recorded them here. And we know that his account of these things is accurate. Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. So, just interesting. This is how we know John is the disciple Jesus loved. This is from the Gospel of John. And this is how John ends. And so, you might say, there's no ascension here. Right. So, what we need to do is go back. Now, what you have with the Gospels is... And, Today, I'm going to try not to use any fancy terms, right? So, they're, but they're called the synoptic gospels. So just think summary, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Uh, as we learn through the series, they do share quite a bit in common. Matthew, though, gives us a lot more information. For example, you get the Sermon on the Mount and other things like that. And when you put them together, you can see sometimes, remember, Luke will actually like, clarify some things. So if a statement's short, it's been taught before, he's like, he just say, no, well, also this. So they're different perspectives, different angles on the story, not contradictions. So if we go back to Matthew, start from the beginning and go to the end of that gospel account where we are, we're going to see this. Matthew chooses to point something else out. Matthew 28, 16. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. So we see that again. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations ethnicities or peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So there's a lot here. I'm not going to spend too much time on what people call the Great Commission here, because we're going to do missions in maybe three weeks or so. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to go back here and we'll talk about this. We're going to look at uh, the Church of Acts and how they approached missions and how the early church did it when they were doing it right. But um, if I had to put that, if it says the Great Commission in your Bible in bold letters, that's not in the Greek. <laughs> it doesn't have any numbers or headings or anything like that. Somebody adds that. And what it does is it makes the Bible churchy, right? So we like, you know, over a thousand years later come up with some of these things and then we're like, that's what this says or means. And it, what you do is you end up re literally reading things into the text that aren't there. And so just very briefly, because we're here and you've got to deal with it, I would call this the apostolic commission. That's what I would call it. And again, no fancy words like hermeneutics or exegesis and stuff like that. But who, what, when, where, why? If we applied the same study tools to these verses that we do anything else, what would we come away with? That this is a verse, verse for missions for the church? No, you'd never come away with that. Because what does it say? Very clearly, Jesus, the 11 disciples, Jesus tells them where to go. He meets 
them, not everyone, right? The church, second, it's not really like born yet, so to speak. So he's talking to them, the 11, and he's, they're apostles, and apostles means sent one. Right? Apostello means I send. They're just sent ones. That's the closest word we have to missionaries in the Bible. It's really not there because the sent ones do that. And he gives them this commission, the apostolic commission. So it's going to be really interesting when we get to Acts. I know I'm ruining another uh, set of verses for you. When we get to Acts, we're going to see how they really operate and how this was understood and how the early church understood these verses, not like today. So it's been a little bit abused for missions. It's not the call for everyone in the church uh, to do missions. So we're going to talk about that today. Not everybody's a missionary, but we'll see what we're all called to do. All right, so this is how Matthew ends. We get to Mark. Mark gives like a little snippet of the ascension. Tells us just, there's a little bit, but he mentions the ascension, right? A little bit different. Then Mark concludes. If we go to Luke, Luke 24, 44, then, this is Jesus, then Jesus said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, again, peoples, I forgot to explain that before, beginning in Jerusalem. There's forgiveness of all sins uh, for all who repent, sorry. You are witnesses, remember that word, of all these things. And now I'll send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. So just take note of the word witnesses before I forgot to mention why I bracketed it. Uh, nations. If you, the word, how do I make these? The word for nations, peoples, or Gentiles. When you see those three words in the New Testament, it's a variation, it's one word, ethne. Think ethnicities. That's it, right? So nations is not my favorite translation there. I like when some do peoples because that's what he's really talking about. We're going to see that because remember when he sent them the first time like Matthew 10, he's like, don't go to anyone but the lost sheep of Israel, right? So, and they <laughs> don't hang out with the Gentiles or even the Samarians, right? So it's got to come to the Jews first. That's the idea. So they're going to be a little confused about this in Acts. Like you said not to go to anyone but the Jews. And then Peter has the vision, Acts 10. So we'll see all that. But you got to think, nations, when we think of nations, what do we think of? We think of a map. We think of like countries with borders and boundaries. Those boundaries change significantly. I mean, a lot, right? So every time there's a war, boundaries change. So Jesus isn't like limiting this to geographical boundaries. That's why I don't like nations. What he really means is go to everybody, right? So like this is like anti-racism. Like you're going to go to everybody now. People everywhere, the Gentiles, meaning everybody else but the Jews too. Right? That's the meaning behind this, right? So just so you understand that. So just take a note of witnesses. Luke 24, 50. Then Jesus led them to Bethany, and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. So they, here we see it again, they worshipped him, and then returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy. And then they spent all their time in the temple praising God. God. So there's no, like, church per se just yet. It's kind of mixed. It's like Christianity is seen as a Jewish sect in the beginning, the sect of the Nazarenes. So they're kind of intermixing, trying to get the Jews in, into this, right? So... Uh, that's how that book concludes. So now, uh, when Luke writes Acts, so the Gospel of Luke is written by Dr. Luke, uh, and he writes Acts too. And so when you're reading it, the first question that might come to mind, like if you're just reading the whole New Testament, is like, well, why aren't they together? Right? Why aren't? Well, remember, the Gospels. So the early church, they want to keep all the Gospels together. So John's like in between them. All right? But when I read Luke, I like to like read Acts too. Uh, and if you ever try to do that in Greek, it's hard. He's a really smart guy, so lots and lots of big words, uh, very eloquently written. Um, so if we hop to Acts, I told you we're going to see the ascension retold. So here's what he says, and now it'll make sense if you've just read Luke. Acts 1.1, in my first book I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions. Who were the instructions given to? The apostles. See, if we keep reading through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once, when he was eating with them, ah, here we get all the answers, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Right? So we see the who did he give the instructions to? 
the apostles. So we've talked about this too, and I just this is in the text, and we'll get to where we're going. Acts 1 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. Did we get that? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, remember that word, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Everywhere, right? So he's just everywhere. So really quick, we've talked about this before. Um, prophetic, like the, the end times ministries, right? Someone starts doing that and he says, what they know, they say they know when it's going to happen, just la, 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 just walk away. Because what did he just say? It's not for you to know. Right? So what you say to them is, ye of little faith, like, <laughs> go away. Because that's what it is. Why do you want to know when it's going to end? Well, so I can sin as much as possible right up until the last minute. Right? <laughs> so, like, why are we so interested in that? Or just, I don't know, how about have faith and just live like Jesus is coming back now? Wow, then maybe people would like see us as Christians, right? <laughs> no, we don't want to do that. We want end times prophecy. So if someone starts doing that, just stop, stop, stop. Jesus doesn't know. How do you know? The Father alone knows. But I know more than Jesus. That's how arrogant we get sometimes. So, so here we get a summary uh, with a few more details. Acts 1.9. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching. And they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. So a little summary there with a few details. And you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. We will witness about me everywhere. Now, last week we talked about witnesses. We talked about the women. It was how amazing it was that the women were witnesses to the risen Jesus. And they, indeed, they were not allowed to be witnesses in a court of law. So we talked about how crazy that was. Just why is that even in there? Well, because it's true. That's it. That's why it's in there. It's true. Embarrassing details. The New Testament, books of the New Testament, with the exception of Hebrews, they're all witnesses. They're all written by someone who, what, like Luke, he's like a reporter. He gets all the information. Or people actually witnessed it. We talked about John, you know, Matthew, Mark probably as a boy. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> so when you're reading Greek, when you first start reading Greek, something happens to you when you get to the word witnesses. And when you're reading it, you go, huh? Because it's a word, and I, now look, I can read biblical Greek okay, like first or second grade level. <laughs> it's like I hack my way through it, but I can't speak really well, and Greek people have told me that. So <laughs> it's a word like martyras, and that's how you're going to try to pronounce it if you're me. Now, a Greek person would say, bad accent, but also <laughs> they would say, witness. That means witness. And they would think, like, when we say witness, we think, like, of a courtroom scene and someone getting up on the stand, right? That's a witness. We think of something like that. And that's the same picture they would get in their mind and should get in their mind because that's what the word means. But when you're sounding it out or you're looking at it, the letters are different, you're looking at it, you will see the word martyr. You'll see the word martyr. And it's really weird, because when you're trying to translate it into English, you want to translate it as martyr, because that's what you're seeing, right? And so Jesus is telling me, you're going to be my martyrs. And it's weird. It's like, well, that's kind of strange. But indeed, he did tell Peter he was going to die, right? <laughs> so how did this happen, right? So you're looking at early church history. And indeed, it was a courtroom term. Witness, that's what Jesus is saying. You're going to be my You're going to basically testify to me. That's what he's telling them. But there's a little more to it as the church develops. As the church develops, crazy things start happening. The Christians become persecuted. And uh, they die some pretty horrible deaths. And the Romans think, like, usually, like, crucifixion, things like that. They'd leave the bodies up there for a while. You know, just to scare, it's supposed to scare people into behaving what you're supposed to behave. And so they go in and out of these waves of persecution. They didn't like Christians, right? So at times you weren't supposed to or be allowed to be a Christian. I don't know, you got to worship the emperor. Like, we're not going to do that. And so it's not like civil disobedience. It's just, it's just religious worship, and then they're getting persecuted for it. Now, martyr, when we think of that sometimes, we think of, like, Muslims, right? That, that's a perversion of martyrdom. That's not good martyrdom. Martyrdom is you die. You're the only one who dies, and you go out, like, proclaiming Jesus. 
that's it, right? It became a big trend, so big that like some of the officials, there's one that was quoted as saying like, they're having like this math, basically it would be like not stopping a worship service and someone just coming in like, you die, and they still keep singing, right? You die, and they just keep singing. They're not, like they have to kill all these people and it gets to be so much that like, don't you have like ropes to hang yourselves with and cliffs to jump off of? Like, why are you making us do all this work and killing you? So it became this very voluntary thing. Now, here's the thing, right? So you think about martyrs, like, what? Well, a couple of things. Christians today, for the most part, don't read their Bibles. And so you never read, like, how it concludes. You never read, like, how did they really take this? And people will get all these false conclusions because they never read it to the end. I, mean, I told you guys this. Would you do a book report and not do a conclusion if you never read the conclusion? Yet Christians do. It's amazing. So, so you get to the end and you see that those who are martyred in the tribulation, those who are martyred in the tribulation, they get to rise up with Jesus first. And so if you actually believe this and you actually read this, you're like, martyr? Awesome. You're going to die anyway. <gasps> Did anyone here not know that? Right? So but people, Christians act like they're never going to die. You're going to die anyway. What better way to go out? And then I get to rise up the first, two resurrections. First resurrection and reign with Jesus? That sounds pretty amazing, if you believe it. If you don't, it doesn't. And that's where the robber meets the road. So it was an appropriate response to true faith in this. That's what it is. And indeed, in today's accounts, he tells Peter, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you like. You dressed yourself, went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Like a cross. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Don't you want to glorify God? Then Jesus said, follow me. Does this sound familiar? Jesus says it all the time. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. These are the prerequisites. He lets everybody know this could get you killed. Think about it. What king goes to war with his 10,000 troops versus like another army of 20,000 troops without first, you know, consulting his advisors and maybe drawing up terms for peace? That's what Jesus says to people who want to follow him. Think about it. Interesting. So, obvious question comes to mind. You may be thinking about it already. Would I die for Jesus? Would I die for Jesus? Are you willing to die for Jesus? Now this, you know, you don't hear this in church a lot, which is really strange, because you hear Jesus say it all of the time. If you've been with us in the series, how many times has he talked about this? I got to a point where I was like, I'm talking about death every week. I think we lost 10 people, right? So it was like, I had to say something about it. I'm like, listen, guys, this is just, if you follow Jesus around, this is what you'd hear. That's all we were doing. That's all we're doing. We're just following Jesus around. What does he talk about? Death, hell. Like, you know, like, I was, I'm like, you know what I mean? Like, I can't apologize for it. He's God. You should be thinking about this. That's depressing. Okay. <laughs> now, here's the thing. A lot of people, like, they make excuses. Well, that's not going to happen to me. I don't live in a country like that. Right? They say all these different things. And so they kind of like, yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to worry about that now. But what if? What if you did? So if it came down to that, <clears throat> Jesus gives a very stern warning. And it shouldn't be ignored. So I remember I talked about them being sent, right? So it's in that chapter, in Matthew 10, 32. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But... Everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Uh-oh. Would we deny Jesus to save this body, this life? All right? If that came down to it, I'm going to cut your head off if you deny, or if you don't deny Jesus, right? Just cut it off. Okay. Nope. Jesus is my Lord. Would we deny it? Even though he's told us, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, right? Gain this life and things in it, and then lose your soul. 
Now, when we think of martyrs, we think of life and death, right? So let me dial it back in a little bit. So I went all the way there. Everyone's quiet. So let me, let's pull it back. How might we deny Jesus in smaller ways? Because the verses there have the same gravity without martyrdom attached. So how might we do that? Like, are we worried about what it might literally, literally cost us here? Will we deny him for a job? Right? Afraid to tell your boss or your Christian or something like that. We deny him for a job, for money. Right? Maybe for family members who disagree with him. Maybe we're, we're so uh, into like, you know, who we are as a culture and we've placed our identity in that. And we have this family identity. And I can't change because that's my identity. But you're like, no, I can. You decide to. Right? I'm not identifying. I'm a Christian. That's what I am now. I follow Jesus and that's it. What does it cost us our family, our friends? Believe something there. I, this was a big thing with me. Like, no, I will not go and do those things with you anymore, right? No, oh, you're judgmental, right? I'm like, no, I just don't want to do those things anymore, right? I'm in a relationship with Jesus, and so you lose friends. Mm, okay, you're a Christian now, you know? Now, it's funny, because Jesus must have thought of that. Because if we just keep reading the next verses, Matthew 10, 34 don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came to, not to bring peace, but a sword. Now, we've learned about what that sword is, right? Because he's not talking about hacking your family up. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's not hard. Your enemies will be right in your own household. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of being mine. He said it again. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you'll find it. Like this is literally like straight shot to eternal life with Jesus. If you give it up for me, you don't have to have anything about that, right? Like a lot of us, I mean, even theologians through the years have struggled with whether they're saved. Like am I saved? Am I okay? Am I going to hell? Like, this is better. Like, you can die, and then you know, I'm not going to hell. Ha <laughs> ha. It's a, you could just die. There are no questions in your mind. I'm going to chop off your head. Nope, Jesus is my Lord. Now you're home with the Lord. Bam. It's certain. If you believe, if you try to save your life by denying Jesus, you will lose your eternal life with him. Clear as a bell, again and again. He keeps saying it. Now, we talked about, like, cults, false religions. Like, knock, I call them knockoff religions because that's what they are, right? So one of them was Islam. It's a knockoff religion, right? So 600 years later, they pervert the Bible. They twist it all up, make up their own story. Someone goes away, has an experience, right, and then goes back, no witnesses to it at all, no credibility, and then people just take him at his word. Wow, maybe they do have more faith than us, right? So it's crazy. It's a knockoff religion. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. So when I'm backing up from everything, I'm going to get in some honest territory here. When I'm backing up and I'm looking at like Christians, because so that you know, I was, I was raised like Catholic, but I was not devout like, or anything like that. We didn't, I didn't ever read the Bible or anything like that. So uh, it was nominal Christian. I was just like, you know, we're Italian Catholic. And we weren't even Italians either. So we, then they weren't Catholics either. So it was just like, I don't know what we were. So I grew up without any real, <laughs> without any real faith. And so it's easy for me to pop into other worldviews. And so I've been a part of like Satanism. Uh, I've been a part of all kinds of Taoism, all kinds of different worldviews. And I've seen a lot. So it's easy for me to kind of back up and go, okay, let me look at Christians. And then let me look at Muslims, right? And then see how they're doing it. I'm going to give this to the Muslims. They win on one thing. That's why they're growing faster than Christianity. They're very convincing. They're very convincing. They are willing to put their lives where their mouths are. And a lot of Christians aren't even willing to put 10% of their money where their lives are. <laughs> They make a lot of Christians look like a joke, if we're being honest. If I'm looking at both things, they are very, very believable. <laughs> it's very bold, I know, but I have to be honest. I'm not a liar. 
right? I couldn't always tell you the truth. You can rely on me for that. From what I observe, I would have to say that there is no way most Christians believe this by their behavior. I'm like, really? You know, like, you've read this and you believe this? And, and it's crazy because now young people, scared to death. I get that. When you're young, like, you know, you, you get up to my age and I'm like, just, I've had it. You know, stuff starts falling off, out. You know what I mean? Like, really? You know, I just, like Paul, I'm like, pack this tent up and get to my new heavenly body. Let's go. Like, I'm ready for it, right? But when you're young, I get it. Everything works still, like, and you're good. And so I, there's so many jokes I could tell that are so inappropriate, but I'm not going to do it. So anyway, <laughs> just waking you up. <laughs> you were thinking it. But anyway, I cannot. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> Stop. Okay, Holy Spirit. There we go. Back on track. We're here. So, <laughs> but I get it. Young people, right? You're still young. You're enjoying life. You're having fun. Everything's good. And, you know, you want other things. You want to see your kids grow up and all that other stuff. And after they grow up, you're like, okay, I'm done. She made it. I want to get out. And so it's different. We're thinking differently, right? But what kills me, like this is like killed me. When I see like 80-year-old Christians Right? I had, they, they've been in church, they're not here. You're, clearly, you know why. Right? But like, you know, one guy, I was talking about the martyrdom. I, I gave that teaching, and it's correct. And he's like, no thanks. I was like, you're just hungry. Shut up. You know, so, and then I go, well, he's overweight, and you made fun of him. I'm like, oh my gosh, just leave. But anyway, you see 80-year-old Christians, like, no way, and they bug out. Like, it's the craziest thing in the world. They're like, all in their politics or whatever, they're like, they're persecuting us. They're persecuting us. They're persecuting us. I'm like, calm down. Go to a country where they're really killing people. Like here, like if we refuse to bake someone a cake, right, that's our version of persecution. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. You know what I mean? It's, now look at Muslims. That's embarrassing. Like we were joking on the way in, like if I was going to do church takeover, the first thing I'd do is I'd go outside and I'd scrape all the Jesus fishes off the car and make everyone like earn them back. You know what I mean? Like bring a friend to church and they need to report that you preach the gospel to them and make sure they're Jewish. You know what I mean? Like, like <laughs> you'd get all your, your things back. It's embarrassing. Guy. Can I be honest? Sometimes like when I say I'm a pastor, it's embarrassing. Like because I know how most people see Christians. There's a really good reason why. It's embarrassing. 80 years old. You're freaking out about dying. You're 80 years old? Mr. Potato Head, you dropped an ear on the way in. You know, some of these people, like, they're just, <laughs> it's true. The he's literally falling apart. You're still falling off your body. Like, let it die. Death is the best thing that could happen to you right now. The best thing. Like, well, what is wrong with you? Why are you worried about that? It's going to be painful. Every day of your life is on pain. You're on 13 medications for pain. And you're worried about someone cutting your head. It's going to be so fast. So I hear. I just don't know. I've never experienced that. <laughs> really? <sighs> like someone give him coffee? No, I'm tired. This is what happens when I'm tired. It's true. I'm really tired. <laughs> I mean, if this is the way they behave, there is no way. There's no way. And I know this is challenging a lot of people. And, and if you're older, you have no excuse. So you're done. But the younger people, I get it. But, like, come on. Read this. You know, if you really believe this, it should really change your perspective about these things a little bit. Just a little faith. You know, so I get it. it. It's a walk. So don't worry. It, you know, you're trying. But, like, what I would say, especially if you're, like, over 70 or 80, hurry up. <laughs> hurry up, right? So come on. So here's this thing. It's all about relationship. Some have said this is the key, and indeed, when you think about it, like, so let's think about it really practically, joking aside, like, I don't think that's possible for me, so I can't make that kind of promise. But, um, you know, you think about your loved ones, right? And I don't think if we really love, like, you know, our wife, our spouse, you know, our kids, especially kids, right? Like, I, I hope every father in the room would die for their kids. I could just hope that. You know what I mean? Like, if your kid was in danger and you could save the kid, some pick or some scenario, I, without a doubt, like, definitely. It's not even going to be a thought in my mind. And I think that most fathers who love their kids think that way. Like, I think that way. My wife, absolutely. And that's really selfish because I'd be really sad if she died and I don't want to be without her. So I'd just die first. Bye. <laughs> like, I go, see you later. Anyway, so anyway, but most of us would do that. I'm just being honest with you. It's selfish. Like, I die first. You know, so... 
But now with that in mind, I told you I could not stop myself from joking. He can joke about death. Yes. So this is the key, right? Being in a devoted relationship, having a relationship with someone, loving someone, that is the key. And indeed, it is the key to, will it, to be willing to be di- to martyr, to die for Jesus. I told you I was tired. All right? That's the key to develop that. Like, how do I develop that kind of willingness to give my life for the Lord? How? Well, it begins with the relationship. That's where it starts. All right? If you love him, and I will say this, husbands, you must love Jesus more than your wife. More, that's what he said. More interesting, but I'm going to tell you that that's the key to being a better husband and a better father. It has nothing to do with you. That's the key. That's the key. So, but if we are in a relationship with him that's deep like that, and we love him, no problem. Of course I'm going to die for Jesus. There's your key. So, natural question. How do you build that relationship? A lot of people struggle there. You know, it's like, well, how? I can't see him. You know, like, what is this? It's not the same thing. Like, it's weird, right? So how do you build it? Well, by being more devoted. And relationships, they take work. I'll give you guys a couple action steps today. They, They take work. It just, it takes work, right? So a lot of people, there's like this Christian kind of myth where it's like they don't have to read their Bible they just all of a sudden like, yay, I got baptized. I have instant faith in Jesus without knowing anything about the Bible or anything. And I just have this relationship with him. And that's it. Like, that's all I need to do is great. Everything's going to be great. Wrong. That's not what the Bible says at all. Faith comes through hearing. Romans 10. Hearing. Hearing about Jesus. That's how faith goes in here first. It then starts to make its way down here. We have to know the truth. We're not called to be stupid. We have to know the truth. And so what they'll do is to kind of throw everything away. And the truth is, they just don't want to do any work at all. They're lazy. And so they say, oh, saved by grace. And that's it. And that's true, Ephesians 2. Saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. But keep reading the next couple verses. We're created anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good works. It's both. So when someone says it's all about relationship and that's it, eh, it's another false Christian he's saying. Yes, it's about relationship. <laughs> it's the other side of the coin. It's also about showing people you're a Christian. This is how we're all called into that witnessing phase. So look what the Bible says about religion. James 1.27, pure and genuine religion. Jesus' brother is writing as if it's a good thing. And the sight of God the Father means caring for, visiting orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. The Bible says religion's a good thing. Huh. Both sides of the coin. So it begins with our belief in him, right? We need to actually believe this. And we talked about a lot of that. Uh, we talked about, like, knowing what the Bible is, why we believe it. Like, that's important. It begins, then it develops into faith with him and develops into this relationship if we have a devotion to him, if we're devoted to him, we're in a committed relationship with him. That's how it works. So... Some faith-building exercises. And this is, this is the first one. I, just, I know I say this a lot, but it, it really, we as a Christian community, we need to change the way we think. Talk about being corrupted by the world. Like the world has really corrupted Christianity in this country. It looks nothing like biblical Christianity in this country. So the world has really corrupted a lot of Christians. So how do you get uncorrupted? Well, like, so here's a test. This is going to show, like, if people, a lot more people watch this online. So this is going to be a test. Okay, don't, don't answer this loud. Just keep all your words to yourself. All right, but what if I gave you a homework assignment this week? And I said, I'd like all of you to read, to read or listen to the Bible for two hours every day. Right? People would be like, Pastor, you're crazy, right? So other pastors are like, you can't say that, right? How many times do you? Yes, I can. I just did. Read your Bible two hours a day. Now, I just want to, let's think about this for a second, right? What do we do for two hours? We watch TV for two hours. I'm not even getting into the sports. Not even going to go there, okay? So I'll leave you alone. (laughs) But think about it. I could. And I'm not even touching on it. It's really bad. TV, useless, mindless things on your phone, you know? (laughs) Passive-aggressively, like, arguing with people, like... 
stop it, right? Or just take the Jesus fish off. But take the cross off your profile if you're going <laughs> to. So anyway, <laughs> don't fight, right? So, but, but let's think two hours. What are you doing for two hours? Now, don't give me the, like, I work, I'm going to get to the I work all the time thing. That's, you're just as bad. So two hours, right? Stupid things you do for two hours, a lot. But we won't do that. And then we say, we love Jesus. I love Jesus. I'm going to heaven. You know, I'm in a relationship with him. Amen, amen. This is great. Okay, so you watched a movie. Why can't you read the Gospel of Matthew? It takes about two hours. You can answer that question for yourself. Why aren't we as motivated to go here as we are to like all these other, and to tell you the truth, they're corrupting us. The world is corrupting. I'm not one of these, like, we call them in the house, now it's out, right? So duck and cover Christians. That's what we call the Christians that do that. They hide from the world, right? Like, no, I'm going to duck and cover. I'm only going to do homeschool. We're going to keep our kids away from Disney. Uh, you know, like, it's just like, it's demonic, you know? Like, you're like, oh, my gosh, you know what I mean? There's a difference between, like, Jesus did hang out with sinners and tax collectors, right? So it's like, you know, you get filled with the Holy Spirit, then demons can't get in there. Like, don't worry about it. You're good. You have to interact with people. You don't engage with the bad things they're doing. But what are we going to do? Just huddle up as a church. And that's what they do. They huddle up as a church, right? And they see like Halloween is a time to hide. I see it as a great time to give the kids who are dressed as like Disney princesses candy and a church like business card. It's like shooting fish in a barrel, guys. It's easy. We're going to talk about when don't. It's not literally shooting fish in a barrel. But you just think about it. It's easy. That is an opportunity. We're going to hear that word today. It's an opportunity. Get out there. And if your kid believes and they die for Jesus, great. You'll see them in heaven. That's it. So we have to change the way we think. What do we spend our time doing? And does it have real value? Right? Now for the, but I work too much. Okay, let's talk about the Sabbath. All right? So, like, you know, when people come up to me and they're like, oh, I haven't taken a day off in like 30 days, like, like, that's not a good thing. You need to rest. God rested. You're better than him? Like, cut it out. It's prideful. I've said this before. I'll say it again. The, the Sabbath is the only one of the Ten Commandments that Christians are actually prideful about breaking. Pride, it's all here. Pride, 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 pride. I'm going to tell you, I get, I'm tired today. I'm honest about it, right? But I get to Saturday and it's like, okay, <laughs> that's it. I'm done. Shh. <laughs> Everyone be quiet. I'm finished. I need rest. I'll admit when I'm tired, I'm done. Like, this hurts. Everything hurts. I'm like, I need, I need just to take a day off. That's okay. Spend time with the Lord, my family. That's great. That's another way to build that relationship, and we need to think about that. You know, if you're not spending time with anyone that you're in a relationship with, how are you going to develop the relationship? It's going to get worse. Are you listening to them? Like prayer. A lot of people don't understand. A lot of prayer is listening. Just shh. Read that. Just absorb it, right? The answers are, what's so funny is I watch people, they pray for everything. Christian, why or this, that. All the answers are right here. They're all right here. Just read this. You don't have to ask so many questions. Well, I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> Most Christians spend more time in the world than in the Word. And that's the problem. This is a part of that good religious behavior that helps us deepen that relationship with Jesus so we know the difference between him and all the fake Jesuses people are presenting out there. I told you, that's why I don't watch shows like that. I'm like, no way. It's so far off from this. It makes me nauseous. Like, you just can't stand it. It's just wrong. But that's because, I'm not saying better or worse than, I'm, I know I'm in a relationship with Jesus, and I'm in his word constantly. And so, spot falls like a bad note. Like, you just, I spot it really quick, simply because I know it. We need to really know Jesus to be devoted to him. It's funny because, like, if you do couples counseling, one thing you're going to hear along the way somewhere, I don't even know you anymore. You'll hear that. I don't even know you anymore. It has been said that distance makes the heart grow fonder. But I would add, of someone else. 
There's no such thing as a long-distance relationship with Jesus. We must develop our relationship with Jesus. We must nurture our relationship with Jesus until we are molded into his image. You can tell when someone is in a committed relationship with him because they act like him. And this is how we become good witnesses for him. We must not deny him by the way we live. <clears throat> We've seen this before. You can deny him. We talk about denying Jesus, right? Go back to that thought. In Titus, Titus is, uh, Paul's telling Titus about all the false teachers, right? In Crete, where he is, he's planting churches. And he says this, Titus 1.16, such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. So they claim they're Christians, but deny God by the way they live. So take it back to that verse that I said before. If you deny me, I will deny you. And if we read the word of God, it says we can deny him just by our actions without even saying a word. They're detestable, disobedient, worthless for anything doing good. If the first part wasn't bad enough. The Bible's not always so nice, is it? So this is the first and most critical part of being a witness for Jesus. What we do says more about what we believe than anything we can say. Important to remember that. So we may not all be called as apostles. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. But we're all called, as we can see in the text, to be witnesses, to not deny him. We're all called. Don't deny him. Like, be witnesses. And witnessing begins with a relationship with Jesus and then extends out to others. That's just how it works. You mold into his image, love, 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 and that's how it works in any situation. So kind of an interesting thing. I'm just going to give you a couple little practical examples and then... We'll go eat because I'm getting hungry, right? So, <laughs> so you have this guy. He passed away, but Nabil Koresh, well, he was uh, a Muslim uh, at one time and then converted to Christianity. And he was famous for uh, being a good apologist, for being able to argue and you know, make the, the case for Christ like in very complicated environments. Like he'd go to universities and all these kids who think they're smart. You know, he'd be able to engage with them and win all the arguments. Like that's his job. But what was really funny is he gave everybody the key, and it was not what anyone was looking for, what they wanted, or what they thought because it was really hard work. He said, I converted to Christianity not because of a convincing argument, but because the Christian was really being a Christian and loved me for a really long time until we developed trust. Ding. That's the key. So it was like his roommate or something like that. And he was just patient with him, patient with him, patient with him. And finally, he believed it. He came at him with the right verses and all that stuff. Relationship. That's the key. Both directions. And I told you before, that cold, I call it the cold witness. I told you, traveling around different cities, right? And you have the street evangelists. I'm like, their conversion rate is like 0.5%, right? So they put up 20 videos on YouTube. Look, I converted this person. But like that took them 10 years. <laughs> like it's a horrible conversion rate. Screaming and yelling. I'm a pastor. And I was like, <laughs> that's crazy. Like, I don't want anything to do with them. I'm like, and I know, yeah, what you're saying is true, but it's crazy. Like stop being nuts. Like buy people cups of coffee or something. Like crazy. It doesn't work. But, right, it's a lot easier to vent our anger, which we're not supposed to be doing as Christians. It says that too. So a lot of people have just asked me how and so what I hear a lot of, and this is going to just, I'll leave you with a couple of quick little tips. Um, it's kind of like you, well, let's see, I think my wife would make this argument. Like, it's easy for you, right? It's easy for you because, like, I'm, re this, this, like, Forget about it. Like when no one's watching, it gets crazier sometimes, right? But the thing is, I am an extrovert, clearly, right? But I like people. Well, to tell you the truth, sometimes I don't. But, but, but I like, <laughs> just confessing my sins, right? So I'm just like, oh, it's hard. But it's not hard for me. If you've been at this church for a while, you know it's not hard for me to engage with you. I like talk, not get engaged to you, but talk to you, right? Like I talk to everybody. I always got something to say. So I'm going to give you some Pastor Gene tips. Like how do you do that? You're, you're probably never going to be like this unless you're Tony Johnson. Like we're the only two people in the room who will like just like, he likes talking to people like shooting him. But, like somebody will like literally shoot at him. And he'd be like, hey, friend, you know, let me tell you about Jesus. That happens. Like, really, he's a cop. So that's why. Like, why would they be shooting? Because he's a cop. Nice ringtone. 
That's interesting. <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> but like we're the only two people who are like that. Like, you just shot at me. That was awesome. I would have gotten to meet Jesus. Like, it, so bad you missed, right? So, <laughs> so sorry, Crystal, and we're not going to pray for that. But, <laughs> but some tips, right? So, like, I'm not crazy. We, we go to France, right? So we go to France, and, like, you'd think, like, he's not going to talk to anybody here, right? So <laughs> we go to a restaurant where you got to get seated and then go get your food. And so they're like, okay, we'll go get the food because if you get the food, it's going to be really dangerous. So we'll get the food. You get a table. You're good at that, right? So they come back, and, like, I'm, making, I'm sharing a table. Was, there was like no table. So I was like, I sat down at the table. I'm like, hi, my name is Gene. What's your name? You know, and, it's like, and that's it. And they come back. I'm like, hey, meet so-and-so and so-and-so. Kids in college. Kids going to school. They're here. They're here from America. They're American like us. Who would have thought? You know, there's Americans to talk to. And they're just like, like now I think they're used to it a little bit. So it's like, but generally it's like, just want to be on vacation, can we, you know, so that's the way it is, so for me, it's easy, like, I'm the first, I'm like that kid, I'm not worried, on the first day of school, I'm like, yes, make friends and talk to people, but a lot of people will say, like, no, no, but I was never good at making friends, like, how do I make friends, how do I do that, right, and so, uh, even if you'd never asked that question, you should have, you should have said, how do I make friends, and then asked me, because you don't have, never mind, (laughs) so, I'll give you some tips, like, if you tend to be introverted, right, it's actually really easy, the key, now see, I talk a lot, so I'm being a hypocrite, but it's different, right? I do that for a living. The key is not talking so much. That's the key. And when you do, just ask questions. Now recall, like first, second, third, fourth, fifth, every conversation I have with most people, what happens? I compliment your clothing or something like that, or ask you where you got it. I ask a question, or I try to give a compliment. That's how you do it, Right? Like, so Tony Johnson, like, you almost shot me. Good job, right? So he's going to compliment, <laughs> he's going to compliment something. We're, we're going to try to find, we're looking. That's what good pastors are doing. I'm not a good pastor, but I'm a great pastor. No, but uh, <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a joke. But anyway, you're, you're trying. When I learned in ministry school, my mentor taught me this. He says, it's like having five games of double dutch going on at the same time. And you're trying to find the right place to hop in each game without interrupting it or ruining it. That's what it's like. That, that's what being a pastor is like. All right, so I'm just kind of listening to you a little bit, and I'm just trying to find, like, like where do I get in there just, just to find something nice to say? You know, the curmudgeons are the worst, because I'm like, you know, well, that's bad. And I'm trying to, like, well, you know, that's nice. You know, my husband died. Well, I think he's going to heaven. You know, so anyway, <laughs> but, you know, I'm always trying to find something positive to say, right? And then when all else fails, I say, pizza, I'll make you pizza, and that always works. So you need (laughs) no pineapple on it. So, sorry. That's the thing. Listening. Praying. Pray without sin. Pray all the time. So many Christians, they talk to other people before they've consulted with the Lord. Talk to guys. You you, want to get angry? Someone's coming at you hard? Like, pray. Pray. Don't even open your mouth. Just pray. Like, just start, Lord, what do you want me to say? Like, just what would Jesus do in that situation? And here's the last part. This, this is the thing. You, apologetics is one thing. You can argue scripture, even Christians, you know, like argue scripture, all this stuff, all day long, right? And usually when someone comes, I've never won an argument. When someone comes to the table with an argument, they're never going to change their mind. Don't even try. Like, it's not worth it. It's a waste of time. But here's the one thing they cannot argue. Your story. They can't argue that. How did you come to know Jesus? How has he impacted your life? How has he changed life? What were you like before Jesus, and what are you like now with Jesus? So when you do start talking, or they ask you the appropriate question, this is what you want to talk about, because they can't argue. Your mess becomes your message. Your test becomes your testimony. And the last thing I'll leave you with, it seems like the hardest thing for Christians to do. It should be the easiest thing. Bless you. <clears throat> seems like the, the hardest. Be transparent. Be honest. Did you do something bad? Just tell them. The Lord knows. Let everyone else know. It doesn't matter. And most of the time, they'll be like, oh, you know, really? I thought you were a Christian. Wow, wait, I wasn't always a Christian. Or I was, and I messed up, and the Lord forgave me. Prodigal son, right? So something like that. 
Just really, like, if you'd be really surprised. We spent many years trying to brush everything on the rug, hide all kinds of stuff, trying to be pretty perfect and, like, rich or whatever, all this stuff. We, we did all that. I had no idea later, like, everyone knew what we were doing. Like, everyone knew what was going on anyway. But, like, then when we would go to people, it would, it would amaze me how many people, like, they've gone through the same, oh, me too. And I'm like, really? Like, I thought they was the only one with problems. And that's how we think of ourselves sometimes, and it's narcissistic. We're not the only one. Everybody around you, the person sitting next to you has problems. Everybody. Nobody in here. Like, trust me. You come in my office, give me five minutes, I'm making you cry. Because you got problems. You got problems. Everybody. And so just be honest about your problems, even if you're struggling now. And here's the one barrier that's going to break down. The belief out there that all Christians are judgmental hypocrites. It washes that away. Uh Uh-uh, no friend. You think you're bad? Nope. It's not just you. I got some problems. But Jesus is helping me with them. Or Jesus has helped me with them. So many people, like heroes, like you're in recovery. Awesome. You guys know this stuff. That's your story. Start there. And like nine times out of ten, oh, me too. Or my family member. Or you'll get this, oh, I wish my whatever was in recovery. That's awesome. That's awesome. Just be transparent. How did Jesus change your life? Just look at all these things as opportunities. So I'm going to close today from, with some scripture. And I'm going to pray for you guys. But you're going to see in the scripture how much is in here. And so this is Paul writing Colossians. He's in prison for not denying Jesus. And there's some interwoven prayer. So this is kind of how he's praying for him. Colossians 4, 2. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. So that's my prayer for the church. Lord, I thank you for everyone who came in to hear your word because that's what we do here. Thank you for your word that you would give it to us in full so that we can know you better, come into relationship with you, experience your love, your grace, your mercy, your peace. My prayer is that you would fill everyone with the Holy Spirit as they go out this week so they'll be just vehicles for your gospel message, delivering your love, your grace, your peace, your mercy, your kindness to everyone they encounter. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.